So good morning everyone. We're here in Miami and I'm sitting here meeting with Bob Greenier of the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. He is a world leading expert in plasma technology and ball lightning. So he has some very interesting viewpoints and he also does validation of different uh, and new and exciting technologies. So we're here talking about the thunderstorm generator this morning. So would you like to uh, expound on your background a little bit? Well, thank you very much, Susan, for that delightful introduction. Uh, yes, basically, I got into this at an early age, that is alternative energy. And uh, it's been a passion of mine throughout my life. And to cut a long story short, back in 2012, myself and a bunch of other people I never knew went to South Korea and we set up a project called the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. And the project is set up to test the claims of other parties. And uh, that ultimately led me to evaluate some aspects of Malcolm Bendel's technology. Brilliant. So tell us, what, are, what is your view of this technology? Uh, how do you see it? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the science of it? and then where you see it fitting into society on planet Earth. Certainly, Susan. So basically, if it's going to be real, ultimately it has to be based on a natural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was sent an image sequence in the form of a video of a glowing thing coming out of one of these spheres and going back into the sphere multiple times, I recognize that as a feature of this coherent matter wave, uh, toroidal moment based, as Malcolm would call it, plasmoid mm -hmm. technology. But ultimately, it comes down to ball lightning. And if I may share with you a few slides uh, on our yes, please do. technology here. In fact, what you're seeing here on the background is ball lightning colliding with fused quartz, which ordinarily melts at about 1700 degrees centigrade. And you're seeing the torus of various levels of fractality in there. So there's one with a five order structure on the top right. Mm. And there's the one down here is a more of a six order structure. But let me show you what the core of that looks like when it's really highly energized. So this is quartz. That, that was, was quartz. fused quartz, yes. Okay. Uh, it normally melts at 1700 degrees centigrade and something is hitting it that's leaving that witness mark. Mm. So what you're seeing here on the left is where a ball lightning in Hestalen, this is an area of Norway, where it has the most high intensity of natural ball lightning phenomena. Uh, and these are sort of what look like UAPs or plasma orbs moving around in the environment. And what happened in this case is it collided with the ground and they could see where it went. They went to where the ground had been impacted. They extracted the soil, soil and they found there, this was in 2002, by uh, an astrophysicist you can see here, Massimo Teodorani, I probably got that wrong, but uh, 2002, they found this iron-rich crenellated sphere with this very interesting signature. On the right, you see this 2.7, apparently, billion-year-old micrometeorite, uh, and it was extracted in and around Melbourne from ancient limestone. And you can see the very clear similarities between yeah. those two. Okay. Now, that is two natural phenomena. One, one is a ball lightning on Earth, and the other one is a meteorite coming in, being broken up in the atmosphere, lots of separation of those ions and electrons, mm. turbulence going on, and it is then hitting the ground 2.7 billion years ago and leaving that thing in limestone. That is the story. That is the, what they claim, and two natural phenomena. What you see on the left here is a, a guy uh, in Czech Republic who went by the code name Me356 doing a cold fusion experiment. And that is uh, two titanium electrodes in alumina, that's aluminium oxide in potassium carbonate electrolyte in light water. Discharges in there and he found this crenellated sphere. And we know because of the, there was no analysis in his equipment he, could, he didn't know what element it was, right. but because we know that the, the chunk on the left is carbon, okay. we know it's significantly lighter, so in, on the balance of probabilities, it's almost certainly to be iron-rich crenellated microsphere. Got it. 
On the right here, this is in the plasma reactor uh, work that we did in 2017. Uh, and this technology was developed by Dr. Georgie Eagley, a world expert in ball lightning. In fact, he was one of the first people in the Soviet era in 1983 to be brought to a, in fact, I think he credits himself with being the first Soviet era scientist to be brought into a nuclear facility in 1983 by the US government. And he wrote many papers over 20 years uh, taking anecdotes of ball lightning uh, from the community in, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Fantastic documents, you can go and find them online. Mm -hmm. And so out of that work, he developed this technology and at the time, I didn't realize that it was very significantly similar to these later examples and earlier examples, but it is. And uh, they are aligning on the magnetic poles. You can see there's almost a, an align this way. Uh -huh. uh, so they're very magnetic in their nature. Wow, so, so you did this independently? Yeah, so th what I've shown you, the first two slides mm -hmm. were natural, natural phenomena. Right. Now I've shown you very similar structures that are produced in this case by electrical discharge. Right. And the iron wasn't, there was no iron in the device, right? This only had charcoal, moisture, and air. Now, what is charcoal? Well, that's most of the carbon that you would get out of a hydrocarbon, yeah. right? Yeah. And here we are, we're seeing iron again coming out of the system. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the next one here, this is actually in a cavitation device. High ultrasound and water and aluminum foil, aluminum foil, yeah? Mm -hmm. And again... 900 seconds later, we've got the same iron-rich crenellated microspheres going on. This is another type of experiment that's in the cold fusion family. Okay? Uh -huh. Now, we do know that in these samples, the aluminium foil is contaminated with incredibly small flecks of iron. But the, it's in water. The water does not boil in this process. So how is iron turned into something that looks like that? And by the way, these structures are hollow. If it was just a metal blob with surface tension, firstly, it would be smooth, sure. and they don't rust. So here we have a water cavitation system. Now, there's a bit of that going on in the bubbler, potentially, of Malcolm Bendel's system. Okay. And we see this process occurring in our cavitation. Then there is going to be plasma in the combustion chamber and in the thunderstorm generator exhaust part of it. Uh -huh. And in our plasma, based reactor, the microwave reactor, we see iron-rich crenellated microspheres. And in both cases, there's no iron in that form to start with. Get it. Okay. okay. Now, when you look at the nuclear reactions of these processes, it kind of explains how the Earth is formed. Mm. Because most of the Earth is oxygen, then it's silicon, then it's aluminium, and, and often there is calcium and iron and, and stuff in there in the top list of elements that are produced. If you take carbon and oxygen, you fuse them, you get silicon, mm -hmm. the second most abundant element in the periodic table. Mm -hmm. If you get carbon, oxygen, and oxygen, you get the formation of titanium. And if I may, I'm just going to show you some other slides from an other cavitation research uh, by a friend that I work with, Dr. Bin Zhuen Huang. So bear with me. Think of a question to ask me whilst right. I'm finding the slide. Well, I would like you to tie this in with the thunderstorm generator. Well, we're going to do that, aren't we? That, that is actually, the quartz has been manipulated. I don't say it's melted. I, I'm saying it's been shifted oh, and moved I around. That, that is a pure fused quartz. It's like a piece of glass, okay. right? And it has no borosilicate in there. It has no lithium carbonate in there. It's no boron in there, boron oxide. It has no fluxes. It's just pure silicon and oxygen. It's the sort of thing you would get in a crystal, mm -hmm. you know, a, a quartz crystal, pure. And so it has a much higher melting point. And so it's, it's extremely interesting that these things can come in and leave these leave witness marks. marks. Yes, so um, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of slides now, uh, following on from where we were in different systems. And then we're going to see the same pattern emerging in Malcolm Bendel's thunderstorm. All right. So we're gonna, I'm going to pick up here. and. What you see on the next slide here is in a plasma reactor by Henk Jürgen in Holland. And you see the iron-rich crenellated sphere. And then out of it, 
there are two disks, and then carbon is deposited. Okay? Wow. Now look at the two disks. They are titanium rich. That is the fusion of CO2. CO2. And this was shown to be what occurs in the work of a nuclear scientist called Dr. Takaaki Matsumoto. But C, in the next slide here, this is an iron-rich crenelated microsphere on the inside of the outside of the thunderstorm generator. Wow. Now, I predicted, based on that loop that, you, that I nice. saw in those images that I was sent, apparently it was made eight years ago, it's 2024 now, uh -huh. uh, in Thailand, a high humidity environment, uh, at, which is conducive with the right electrostatics for producing ball lightning, as it did in Hestal. Mm -hmm. And so I expected this thing to be having electrostatics, charge separation, and the formation of these iron-rich crenelated spheres. Then Malcolm sends me some videos of the, him taking apart this unit that ran for about uh, over eight, uh, eight years, but it did 500 hours of runtime during that eight years, according to his claims. Mm -hmm. And he sent me some pictures, oh, it looks a bit frosty in here. Um, and I said, Malcolm, just wrap it up. You might be contaminating it. I'll be over on the next flight. So I brought a whole bunch of equipment over to look at it with microscopy, macro photography, and so forth. And what I found was is a signature that Dr. Takaaki Matsumoto had seen in his reactors that we had already seen before we found out about Dr. Takaki Matsumoto's 1990s work. And that was these the similar sort of impact marks that I was showing you on the quartz here, mm -hmm. uh, if I can come out, these, right? Mm -hmm. But in pairs often. And uh, they have, like you can see, there's a six-sided one on the center left there on the bottom. That's six-sided. You kind of have to see it. It takes a bit of time to see it. On the top right, you've got a five-sided one, yeah, okay? That right on the top right there there's more six-sided and, and there's another four-sided there actually um, they're, they're a little bit soft on the sides if you know what i mean and so what i expected to see was what matsumoto had seen what we had seen in our experiments and this is what we found on the inside of the outside it was replete with these black deposits regularly sort of semi-regularly spaced like you have to kind of like do a bit of um, heuristics in your brain, a bit of fuzzy, fuzzy logic to see that it's semi-regularly spaced. So these things, they like to attract each other, but they self-organize into an array, yeah? And so we saw hexagonal structures and pentagonal structures that were dark. I would suggest they would be the carbon deposits that get thrown out of these structures when they decay. And I, having seen those, and predicted that they would be there. I then predicted that there would be iron-rich crenelated microspheres. But because the typical scale of these, so if you look at these ones which we actually actually found, uh, you can look at the scale down the bottom left. That's five microns. So that's about five microns. You literally cannot see that uh, with your na naked eye. You need to look at it under a scanning electron microscope. Okay. So that there, um, I said to Malcolm, I said, look, you need you need to give me a sample of this because I need to see if they're there as I predicted and thought they might be, because now we've got these carbon deposits in these pentagonal, hexagonal structures. I'm pretty confident they're gonna be there, okay? So he said, oh, I want it in the Smithsonian. It cost me $50,000 to make. And I, and I said, okay, all right, fine. I don't have to do any more. <laughs> I wanted segments of the sphere and I, because, so we can, we can rent, it's not cheap because we're an open project and we're based on donations, but like for this, it's worth doing. Right, because everything's lining up that it might be there. So we see the, I said, like, I need a less than 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter section. And, and then we can see if you got what you should have if it's doing the process that I think it's doing. Right. And so he said, no. And then two days later, this guy called Kyan, who was working with him, came over and delivered some samples. I took them to Prague and then we found this one. And then moments later, we found this one. And as you can see, this is very much an iron-rich crenelated microsphere. Uh, it has, in this case, a small proportion of chromium and iron. Now, this might be considered a bad thing or a good thing. These things produce incredible magnetic fields, like mind-bogglingly magnetic fields. And they produce what's called a, a topological monopole. And basically, matter can go in and then it gets stuck at this intense magnetic core. And that is where the magic happens, the transmutation. 
Now, if you look at a tokamak or a stellarator, all these different ways that they're trying to create fusion, like at the ITAR in Europe, they're trying to create intense magnetic fields to confine the plasma. Okay. okay? The reason they raise the temperature to millions of degrees is because, because they're trying to overcome the lack of gravity to try and impact those particles so that they increase the chance of a reaction. Well, in this case, it kind of overcomes gravity and it condenses everything into a very small part of the structure. Mm -hmm. And that is where the magic occurs. So, and it is hollow. Here is a Bendel small sphere. You can see it's really small, five microns down there. So you're talking about three, four microns, but it's hollow and the magic happens inside the hollow bit. Okay, and here is another example from Binjirin Huang in water cavitation. Wow. And this is shown both in gas analysis and elemental analysis and isotopic analysis to transmute elements. And just to show you what they look like when you see them with an optical microscope, when they're big enough, because cavitation produces very big ones, they're little shiny balls. They're and you know what? Luminescent. They're, they're actually, yeah, wonderful. And they don't rust. It's a really specific, it would appear, type of iron oxide. And so here again in Huang's work, inside the ball, little tori's go inside that ball, and they were in the process of being transmuted into other elements, and I'll show you that that is the case, and they get ejected, when the, when the, because it, it puts more matter in there that can, than can be contained in that hollow iron ball. So in the part, point at which it goes in, they get ejected again. So I'm gonna show you a couple of other examples here. This is again in Huang, but here is one which is broken. So I showed you one earlier from the work with my colleague, Alan Goldwater down in California. Mm -hmm. it, it broke open, I showed you a section. I've shown you one in Malcolm Bendel's, which is hollow. Uh -huh. Here, it's like a horse chestnut. It's like the seed pod. It is the seed of life and the new element, you can see these toroidal clusters there uh -huh. that's burst open and when you look at those, what are they? You can see here, they are titanium. All of that brown bit in the center is titanium. What is that? It's the fusion of carbon and oxygen and oxygen, wow. removing CO2. Wow. And titanium is one of the things that Matsumoto observed coming out of his, he had these tubes and out of the center of the tube, which is predominantly carbon, he had titanium and iron and silicon coming out. Mm -hmm. So the, the things going on here, you see, titanium, silicon, alum, aluminium. These are all the elements in the crust that are very high in concentration, oxygen. Obviously a lot of carbon's going in or coming out or synthesized. Right. So essentially that's, that's what it is. So what we know is that in his system, it's actually doing this process for at least some few seconds mm -hmm. during that 500 hours of experimentation. The question for me is, is it doing it continuously? And if it is, it's going to change the whole narrative around carbon dioxide and the internal combustion engine. Exactly. My goodness. So, so back to that sort of high-level gross overview of basically the transmutation we're going from all the CO2 emissions and transmitting that to oxygen. So... Um, just a basic question on that. We know that's happening because it's been measured and it's been demonstrated. So how does that um, Let me show you. Sound, how does it, like, you talk about it being continued. Right, so I worked out this. This is a sample from John Hutchison. Mm -hmm. uh, he is a very novel experimentalist. He doesn't describe himself as a scientist. And it's a sample that I purchased off him through the project. Uh, and it was made in 2007. And what you see here in the, you've got six squares there. In the top right-hand square, there is a yin and yang structure in the center of the group of four that I've highlighted there. Yang on the left, yin on the right. Okay. If you take that and you rotate that 90 degrees in the center lower line, you have a ring that's made out of rings of that quantization size. It's the same ring that I'm looking at the side on the bottom left and that's like an apple core on the bottom left. Mm -hmm. So that's the same structure as in, is in the center mm -hmm. on that bottom line. You take that structure and rotate it through 90 degrees and you end up with another ring which has spokes in it. You see those little spokes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
that is 48 divisions. And what that leads you to produce is a toroidal structure which is made of wheels within wheels within wheels. Mm -hmm. Maximally 48. And when these structures, and this is in a plasma reactor in, by Henk Uren in uh, Netherlands, you end up with these structures. Now, you've seen the witness marks in the background here, right? Let, let me show you that. This is when these things hit fused mm -hmm. quartz, they leave these structures. But what they actually look like uh, when you see the thing that did the hitting, it's this. Uh -huh. Okay, and that is calcium carbonate in those, uh, those uh, rings. So what is calcium? Well, calcium is made of 10 alpha particles. Oxygen is made of four alpha particles and carbon is made of three alpha particles. So if you had a thing that squashed these all into a space, you end up with calcium carbonate, right? And so you've sequestered a large portion of those alpha nuclei into an element that's harmless and is not carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide, right? It's still got carbon orbiting around it. That black stream there is carbon. And you can see here there's 36 divisions on that. And here this would be, if it's a full ring, it would be 48 divided into six. So it's six subtor making, uh, sorry, six sub subtors making uh, 48 subtors making the large tor. Yeah, so it's a, it's a wheel within a wheel within a wheel. This is Matsumoto's work in um, nickel uh, hydrogen cold fusion experiments. It's a tor made of subtors. Okay, this is from 1991 or something. Cold fusion experiment. Here again, a tor made of 48 subtors and little tors within the subtors. A wheel within a wheel within a wheel in cold fusion experiments, okay? Mm -hmm. So th there's a, a good heritage here that shows that if you see these certain signatures, you have the pen potential to transmute matter. And this kind of transmutation would lead to potentially capturing some uh, CO uh, uh, and CO2. Now, the specific question is how do you convert, say, something like methane, this beautiful CH4 molecule, into oxygen? Well, it's through a thing called the toroidal moment. And this toroidal structure generates the toroidal moment. And that allows the, the structure to interact with a thing called relic neutrinos. Now, these things are in all through the universe. Now, if you take normal matter, Everything you and I are made of, you know, the sun is 99.87% of the mass of the entire solar system. It's basically everything. Mm -hmm. And then you've got some other big gas giants or other planets that are far, far bigger than Earth. And we're just a little speck on them and they're a little speck on the sun. So we're basically nothing. Um, these structures uh, gravitationally lens this material called relic neutrinos. They do it because they're growing, they're consuming it. They are living organisms themselves. This is like a living organism, and it can suck in this material which doesn't have charge. It's not electric positive like a proton. It's not electric negative like an electron, but it still has a toroidal moment, which you can't normally interact with, but you can when you've got a toroidal moment. And this material is able to interact with an electron and a proton, and if it's a, a, an antineutrino, it will make an, a neutron. So, you've got your CH4 coming in. One carbon, right. four hydrogens, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that has a bunch of electrons involved. Mm -hmm. That comes into the process. This will pull in some relic neutrinos. And if it converts two of the electrons and two of the protons with some of these electron, electron nu neutrinos in that magnetic monopole, in that little s spherical hollow core, then it converts those into neutrons. You already have two protons left over from the other two H's. You take two protons, that moves it through from carbon-12 through nitrogen-13 to uh, uh, um, oxygen-14, which is not stable. Mm -hmm. But you've also got these two neutrons you've synthesized, which makes it oxygen-16. So you convert CH4 into O2. O, and you do that twice, and you make O2. And there seems to just be a natural tendency for these things, obviously, to just come into sort of a neutral stabilization that's not 
radiation. Oxygen is the most abundant element in the crust of the Earth. Mm -hmm. You already have the answer. The question is, how did the Earth get there? Mm -hmm. If you look at nascent galaxies in, let's say, the Hubble Space Telescope, you will see that they have these two disks, which look like these structures, which you look under, under a microscope or under, under a, uh, when they impact a, a radiographic emulsion. They produce these structures that are like this, like that. If you put two of these monopoles together, they end up looking like that. And in between, you get a disk. And when you look at the spectrum of that disk in this uh, nascent galaxy, you see oxygen. Incredible. That is the spectrum that comes out. Incredible. This works. It's scale invariant, and it works on all levels. So all of your knowledge and all of the, the background that you've looked through as well as your own work that you've done through the Martin Fleischmann and, and your own background. So you basically are, correct me if I'm wrong, validating Malcolm Mendel's... Uh, I am saying categorically for at least a few seconds during that 500 hour experimentation, it, it was doing the magic. I would like to see more investment and investigation mm -hmm. into establishing if it can do it on a continuous basis. Because we know cavitation can. Right. And if he's got a bit of cavitation going on, but I think most of the magic's happening in what he calls the Vrajra, these two spheres, right. counter-rotating right. vortices. Because when the water comes in from the, the bubbler, it's going in and it produces, if it's over 650 degrees C, it will produce um, catalytic, thermocatalytic splitting of the water. That is also charge separated material. You've got shear in there, goes into the engine, that's got explosion shear, comes out and the hydrodynamics in there with the charge separated material can lead to this. It has everything that's going on with that uh, meteorite coming into the atmosphere, breaking up loads of charge separated material, loads of turbulence, creating the iron rich crenellated microspheres. That is the signature of the fact. We see it in this thing. I would like to see a test where you do it and you see like we, we do a test and then we see if it's in there straight away. But we know that oxygen is coming out the other end. Yeah, so th there's good indicators right. that it is doing that. Right, just exactly how, a little, yeah. more, a little more research. Yeah, well from my point of view, uh, right. looking at this from a scientific point of view, mm -hmm. it can do the magic, does it do it all the time? Mm -hmm. Got it. Fascinating, unbelievable. You Thank you very much. You are an expert in all of this. And, um, I'm sure the audience will be rewinding and <laughs> I don't know, I will be anyways, but um, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure. Fantastic. And I, I wish all involved all the success in the world because this is uh, potentially a, a game changing technology. Uh, Absolutely. First strike and for Malcolm and the rest of the